I saw the governor of Arkansas said, my kids keep me humble. Unfortunately, Kamala Harris doesn't have anything keeping her humble. How did that make you feel? I don't think she understands that um, there are a whole lot of women out here who, one, are not aspiring to be humble. And I think it's really important for women to lift each other up. At a rally in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. former President Trump recently told women, you will be protected and I will be your protector. OK, first of all, with peace and love, I don't want Trump anywhere near me. Because he be grabbing, OK? He be grabbing. I do see a little bit of a yellow red flag when men are like, I'm the protectors. I was like, mm, sounds like you be grabbing. Like, it sounds like cute. And I'm open to like a healthy man being like, I'm a protector. But I just feel like you be grabbing. You be, you know, you be ownershipy. You be, I don't know. You, you be a little suspicious. What do you make of that? So he who, when he was president, hand selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade. And we all remember how that went down. Remember when our great Kamala Harris asked uh, Kavanaugh, can you name anything like any law that keeps a man from having agency over his body? He couldn't. We remember those of us who are there. We remember. And they did just as he intended. And there are now 20 states with Trump abortion bans, including bans that make no exception for rape or incest, mm. which we just discussed, which means that you're telling a survivor of a crime of a violation to their body, they don't have a right to make a decision about what happens to their body next. You know what's interesting about that, too? Because from a pro-lifer's perspective, let's bubble hop into the mind of a pro-lifer. They're thinking no matter what, it's still unethical. But like great President Harris says, you exist within the context of all that came before you, right? So even when we're having children, when we're giving birth, it always, and this is why I ask you guys, what do you believe when it comes to why we're here as humans? Not why we're here, the greater meaning, but I mean, literally, why do you think humans evolved or humans were placed here? Because that will tell you how you can interact with sort of the context when it doesn't go exactly the planned way. You know, most babies aren't planned from my understanding of the numbers. They're just a part of life. Humans are animals. We procreate naturally because we want to make love or we want to have sex or we're horny or whatever you want to call it. And then a baby is produced, but the baby isn't always produced in a context that is uh, safe convenient within reason. And so it begs the question from a pro-lifer's perspective, does the baby deserve to be terminated because it wasn't in a perfect context? And it's always about meeting an imperfect context in a way that is sort of better moving forward. And I think that that's sort of the way that I think about it. It's not about whether or not the baby deserves something or the white woman deserves something or the person who carries the baby deserves something or the person who helped make the baby deserve something. It's not about deserving anything. It's about what is the most reasonable thing to do with compassion, love, and deep, deep understanding of how complex this is. You know, sometimes I'll see TikToks, like, you know, had a baby at 15 and now I live with that baby, but it's 18. And it's like, they're really cute TikToks. And I'm so glad that teenage parents were able to sort of find the joy in raising those babies as teenagers. But I think you and I would agree, we do not want teenage parents in the world. I don't think that's a good thing overall. I don't think people are bad because they're teenage parents. I don't think you're doing an evil thing because you were human and in the moment didn't have the education or the wisdom to make a different decision. And I don't think either of you should be punished for that. For pro-lifers, abortion is a punishment. But for people who are neutral, it's more like an abortion is an option because the baby's neither further along or far enough along to sort of be viable. And then on top of that, it's more or less the best decision to make with the most compassion at the time, because assuming the baby deserves to live is also assuming that we sort of have this inherent belief in us as a species, which I don't think we do, which is why we don't agree on pro-life, pro-abortion. I think if it was inherent to us that abortion was always wrong, I think we would know that. I don't think many things are inherent to humans in that regard. I'm not even convinced the need to survive is very inherently within us, but I do think that the need to sort of keep going seems to be. And then 
we always pick what makes sense to us in the moment. Some people will give birth to their offspring and neither invest in it, nor help it, nor nurture it, nor help it grow. And that for me seems more counterintuitive than a person that aborts a child in the name of bringing a better sort of outcome for both the baby and the mother, right? So the irony is like, you'll have these people who will have these babies, but it doesn't seem inherent to them to then foster that child's growth, which tells me that it isn't even inherent that a person who gives birth to a child would have a connection to a child. And I don't think that's bad. I think that's biology. And then we have to have a conversation around what that means, right? So I don't know. I'm not too concerned, I think, with this idea or this. I'm not concerned with this argument, I think, that it's inherent to a human being that an abortion would be wrong. I do think it is better to not have an abortion than to have an abortion. But I think it's better to have an abortion than to have a baby you're not prepared for or do not want or do not want the role of parent. I also think there's a within reason time to have that abortion. In the same way, there's a in reason time to do anything. All things need good timing. Ooh, Level's question in the chat said, there, are there negative things that fives can do, not to terminal to the point that they lose the five status? Fiveness is a state of being. It is not always consistent in a person. So you can be a five who isn't acting in fiveness because it's an act, you have to be actively introspective. And there are, of course, negative things all humans do because all things are inherently negative and positive. There is no such thing as and a perfect human, and there's no such thing as five being anything more than a state of understanding with the self. Fiveness is a state of understanding with the self and extrospection. It is not meaningful outside of the perception you're having with it. Fiveness is only meaningful to the person who's having the experience. It's impactful to those around you, but so is any anything in life. Everything is impactful to the people around them. So fiveness is not... It's just a relationship you're having with yourself and a relationship with yourself often involves a relationship with others, right? So a five is just a person. It's a biological creature. They're going to have biological impacts. They're going to be impacted by their own biology. They're going to have a very human experience of getting into a coma or getting Alzheimer's or being, you know, triggered or getting into their pain or maybe making a mistake or maybe they get really horny and forget to be introspective and boom, you know, I can't predict what a person would do, right? But if they're actively introspecting, actively in their five head space, then I think they're more than likely to make a better decision than a worse decision. This is the same guy that is now saying that? This is the same guy who said that women should be punished for having abortions. Mm -hmm. This is the same guy who uses the kind of language he does to describe women. I think the irony about Trump is that he's definitely pro-choice. And by the way, I think Melania coming out and being like, I'm pro-choice and everyone's like, she's so voting for Kamala Harris. Listen to me when I say this. My theory, this is my theory. My theory is, uh, is Mel Melania wrote that book and said she's pro-choice because they were trying to say like, well, if his wife is pro-choice, maybe he's not as pro-life. And that was going to move voters towards Trump, but it's backfiring and moving voters more tro towards Harris, which I do think is ironic. But I think that's probably what happened. I'm assuming Melania isn't coming out against Trump, but they were hoping her being pro-choice would calm people down about him being anti-abortion. So... Yeah, there you go. I do want to focus on abortion for a moment because two years ago, Roe v. Wade was overturned and women mm -hmm. lost their constitutional right to an abortion. I put out an episode about it. I flew to North Carolina. Yeah. I went to a preferred women's health center. I met with women that mm -hmm. were getting screamed at and chanted at and called baby killers. And it was the most eye-opening experience I've yeah. ever had because I am a privileged white woman that lives in Los Angeles. And I am so aware of that. Um, I understand that a lot of the younger generation sees things online mm -hmm. and it's like, what is right? What is wrong? What is real? What is not? Can you explain and talk about what is actually happening to abortion access right now in this country. Yeah. So again, I thank you for what you've been doing and at the earliest stage of this and following the stories. So, you know, on public policy, I often tell my team, look, I don't want to hear about public policy it is a fancy kind of speech or, or, or paper 
tell me how it'll affect a real person. So let's talk about how it affects a real person. The majority of women who receive abortion care are mothers. So if she's in a state, and by the way, every state in the South, except for Virginia, has an abortion ban. Wow. Wow. Um, Wow, wow, wow. Imagine she's in a state with an abortion ban. One out of three women are, by the way, in our country. And she's a mom. So she's going to have to figure out, one, God help her if she has affordable child care. God help her if she has paid leave. You know, I saw this video, and I'm pausing it a bit so we don't help with the copyright possibilities because it helps. Um there's a video I saw of a woman in her like 60s or 50s or something, a mom who's like an older mom and her older daughter was taking her to like get checked up. She goes, I'm having an abortion. I'm not having this baby. I would not recommend you have a baby in your elderly years, even if you are an anomaly. And don't get me wrong when I say like, I love children. I think children should have a safe and wonderful world to come into. Not that they they ever will, but you know, but I deeply believe there is a responsible action to be taken. The irony of how many people will have their children and then abandon them, having a child so you can go party is, was not the right decision. Having a baby so you can give it to your parents to raise was like, it was the best decision you could make in a hard situation, but we want to do preventative care, right? We're doing preventative care. All of my work is about preventative care. Because once you're in the mess, then we meet the mess where it's at. We meet it face on. But preventative care is so much worth the, it's so worth the investment if people could get ahead of it before it comes. But let's be real. People don't prevent. They get, they wait till it's the last second and then they go, oh my God, what do I do? So then we have to react. And that's why human beings will never have peace on earth because even you day to day cannot prevent because it's too much work. And I know as somebody who invests in birth control and somebody who invests in, you know, pregnancy tests that I take every month, even though I'm on birth control as somebody who, you know, make like, I'm always paranoid about making sure that I'm not, because I don't want to be put in a position I don't want to be in. I know that it costs money and it costs like just a level of stress that a lot of people probably aren't going to want. I'm stressed every month that I'm pregnant. I have birth control and a consistent period but I want to catch it quickly because I only have eight weeks in Croatia to get an abortion. Eight weeks. That's all I have. And until I tie my tubes or whatever, you know, I don't want to take the risk. And even when I tie my tubes, I'll probably have anxiety, but I know how exhausting that is to be preventative, but I really encourage people to be preventative because it's just going to put you at ease, but also you're not going to have to deal with the situation. And it is better to avoid the abortion by having the right birth control. And then if you still get pregnant, abortion is really, really reasonable, right? It's just really, really reasonable, okay? Chat says, I took pregnancy tests every two days and it took six weeks to get a positive test, you know? Chat says, is Croatia very Catholic? It is a very Catholic country. Uh, Gay marriage is illegal. Abortion is a constitutional right because it's a part of the EU. So like Europe in general has abortion rights. So even Croatia has it, but there's a limit. And in general, it's but in general, it's a very Catholic country, though. I would argue that's like kind of half modernized because a lot of people left after, I think, World War Two or World War One, World War Two, one of those world wars. A lot of people left. So all of this to say, I do think there is absolutely Many situations where abortion just makes so much more sense, especially since if you know how babies come to ex- like to be in existence, you know that it's still, a, you know, it is still sad to stop a human being from being able to come into the world. But also they really are just like these little clump of cells, guys, like with peace and love. Have you ever seen those babies that are frozen as embryos and then they're implanted and they're like they were frozen in like 1987 and now they're being born? Yes. We have a technology to freeze embryos in order to implant them later, 10, 20 years after they were conceived. And pro-lifers will say, see, see, that's a baby. It is a baby. It's just not cooked yet. But it is a baby. You're right. That little frozen embryo in 1987 that's now being born in 2024, that's crazy. And that's, that's cool, bro. But also, I get you. Right. It's like a little baby, but also it wouldn't be the end of the world if we like didn't give those embryos a chance to be implanted. 
right? It's just like, it's just like the little bundle that's like waiting, but it's not, it's not really at the stage in which any of our brains are really computing it as a life, even though I think we do sort of emotionally. I do think that's a reality for a lot of people as someone who's been there to support women through like their abortions. There is something very painful about that process, but it is also just a process that's within reason, you know? Now I'll tell you this. I'm actually not a fan of freezing embryos or implanting them 20 years after they were conceived. I think it's all weird. I think people are too concerned with making babies. I do. I think if humanity cared about babies, they would adopt and not adopt out of thievery, but because those babies really needed homes. And if they really cared about children, they wouldn't even need as many adoptees as they do because those babies wouldn't be taken away from their parents because those parents couldn't feed them. But also those parents wouldn't be having babies in the first place. It's a very, it's very complicated. Humans are animals. And it's obvious to me that they don't want to stop having sex. So if you're going to have sex, that's how you make a baby. Be careful. And then she's going to have to go to the airport, stand in a TSA line. And I think it's bullshit that states are allowed to penalize you for leaving your state to get an abortion or any kind of medical care in, in any case. And I think that's where the United States should focus on is the fact that we're even penalizing people for leaving their state to go to a different state to get care. And I swear to God, if you don't move out of that stayed and ditch your stupid family for living there, you're making a mistake. Okay. To the best of your ability, we all have to live somewhere that's going to walk us over in some way. Make a decision about how you get the lease. I'm so sick of all these ectopic pregnancies coming up and people cannot get the care that they need. It's insane. And to me, it is not worth it. You have one life on earth. I'm moving out of that pro-life state. Because you're paying taxes towards this pro-life state that's also putting those taxes to use to discriminate against you and your future ability to represent yourself, live as yourself, work as yourself, live as yourself. I'm sick of my money going to places that overall are doing me more harm than good, which I'm sure a lot of conservatives feel too. I'm sure a lot of conservatives are sick of living in California and giving their money to the liberals. It's kind of annoying. So pick and choose your battles. Sit on a plane next to a perfect stranger to go to a city where she's never been, to receive the care she needs, she's gonna probably have to get right back on that plane because she's got those kids. Her best friend's probably not with her because that's who's taking care of the kids. Mm -hmm. And you know what's even crazier is I can't even get, like I have anxiety going to my regular doctor. Can you imagine getting on a plane and going to a doctor you've never known to go do a thing? That's crazy. Whoa, who is this chatter, bro? Who is this chatter in my chat, bro? This is crazy. Close your eggs and you won't have a problem. You're sick women and women like you who are the huge problem in society. Selfish. Who is this? Pro who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? Are you talking to a ghost? Who said that? Who are you talking to? But you heard me and your little bubble brain went straight to that assessment. That's not what I said, girl. Who are you talking to? You know what I mean? Who are you talking to? Okay. Nobody said that. To get back in that TSA line, to get back on a plane, to go home. And that's all if they can even afford. Mm. Oh, did you see that they gouge prices out of Florida? They literally charge people a, they should be, so airlines, okay. You want to talk about America being the greatest country in the world? Then why the F during a, a hurricane? Do we not have more things in, 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 uh, in place to get people out? And two, why aren't airlines basically letting you fly for free to get out? Why isn't America like taxpayers paying for those flights to get people out? Like realistically, you either make Florida or places that are going to get hurt, hit by hurricanes impossible to live in. Meaning you like, what are we doing? Or like you get these people out of this state and like, I know it can't be perfect, but the fact that airlines were gouging the prices from like $200 regular to $1,100 because they knew people would need to get out is bullshit. Because when Roe v. Wade was overturned, I remember my DMs were flooded mm -hmm. with thousands of women mm -hmm. begging me to help. And yeah. it's overwhelming. And mm -hmm. I can't even imagine, I'm saying that in front of you, but it's, it's overwhelming. And I remember people begging me like, I just need to afford a bus ticket so I can yeah. get out of this abortion desert yeah. that I live in in the South so I can get to a state. But <laughs> Chad says, is that a Jordan Peter? Oh, yes. 
They're killing, they're killing the fetuses. But by being trans, the trans women are killing the fetuses. We need to stop the fetuses from being killed by the trans women. Trans women can get pregnant, you know. That's what they want. They want trans women to get pregnant. <laughs> but they uh, can't even, you know what I mean? Sorry, so it's, it's like these people awful. are literally landlocked into a position that they don't want to be. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing is that you don't have to abandon your faith or deeply held beliefs to agree the government shouldn't be telling her what to do. You know, I love this line and I wish it worked on staunch pro-lifers, but it doesn't. It only works on centrists, which I love. May the centrists all understand this. But pro-lifers who are like one issue voters in that regard, it's not going to work on them. Because they want you to suffer in the name of what they think is right. Because they think, like everyone does, um, that they're doing the thing that like the hero does in the story. You know what I mean? That's what they're thinking. So as m I love, I love this argument. It's such a good one, right? You don't have to get rid of your held beliefs, your personal held beliefs, your strong beliefs, but we agree, no government in our business, right? But they think of it like, uh, they think about it like living in Nazi Germany and you're hiding Jews in your house. And they're like, well, it's the law that I give up the Jews, but I'm not going to do that because I believe to protect the Jews. Yes, we protect the Jews. We also protect the right of a woman to get an abortion. But see, in their head, the Jew in this situation is the infant fetus. So they're like, you can't kill the fetus if the Nazis come knocking. <laughs> well, okay, realistically, I get the logic. I do. I just think they're forgetting the big part here, which is in the context of pregnancy. There is much more at risk here than what you're thinking, as if it's this black and white, right? And nobody knows what they would do if the Nazis came knocking, by the way, because if we saw and we paid attention to what happened in history, plenty of people turned over the Jews, including other Jews. So we do not know what people would really do, but we do know that when women are pregnant and they need medical care, it is best between them and their doctor they, when they make that decision and their spouse, of course, whoever's involved, to know what is best for their medical care. And it is medical care. It is medical care. And I think until you get people to understand that abortion is about medical care, it's going to be very hard to have this conversation. Everyone wants to do the right thing in tough situations. We just disagree on what that right thing is. If she chooses, she'll talk to her priest, her pastor, her rabbi, her imam, but not the government telling you what to do. And that's what's so outrageous about it is a bunch of these guys up in these state capitals are writing these decisions because they somehow have decided that they're in a better position to tell you what's in your best interest than you are to know what's in your own best interest. Which is so ironic since conservatives are always like, the government doesn't know your best interest like you know your best interest. Okay, then get the f out of my doctor's office. They wanna protect you from the government when you can't protect yourself. They want you to mind your business when they don't need help from the government. It's like no one's ever happy. We have to have a good balance with what we expect of people and then move within the reason. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. I mean, daddy gang to put it in um, our TikTok terms. Um, I have seen girls on the street walk up to men and be like, do you know where a tampon goes? Do you know how many tampons we use? Do you even know how like, do you know what a X or Y or Z is of a part of our, and they don't know the answer. I was the first vice president or president to ever in office uh, go to a, a reproductive health care clinic wow. ever. Wow. Really? Yes. 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 I didn't know that, but I guess that makes sense. Mm -hmm. To your point. And yet the men- And it does make sense that, you know, a lot of what changes a person's mind is a lived experience. A lot of what changes a person's mind is having somebody close to them have an experience. But you have to understand these staunch Republicans and conservatives, they're not moved by their kids being gay or trans. They're not moved by their, their nieces and nephews dying because of an ectopic pregnancy. They're not moved by that because they think they're fighting for the greater good, which is why religion needs to get out of government and it should not be incorporated into government. I don't even think the president should say, God bless America. I don't even think the president should reference God or their own religion. I think y'all need to be, mind your own business, okay? Because religion being the default of reality in most of the world is something that we still have to contend with. And 
honestly, the bubble is bursting with every new generation. But the truth is, is we're we're battling God. We're battling an invisible force that people are relying on to make them feel very good about you dying from an ectopic pregnancy. (laughs) And the irony is my mom and I were talking about this like a month ago. And I go, mom, I love you. I'm not dying for an ectopic pregnancy. She goes, no, I'm sure there are loopholes in the Catholic church, Bathy. I'm sure you don't have to die from an ectopic pregnancy. But I asked one of their canon lawyers, who's a priest that they send around to study the church and like understand the church's law. And he explicitly said the way, the one way around an ectopic pregnancy, according to him, is to cut out the part of the fallopian tube, if that's where the ectopic pregnancy even is. It's not always there. And to remove that part of the tube, not then having an abortion to kill the fetus, but because you've taken out a part of the fallopian tube, the fetus dies. Therefore, there. And now you can't have babies in the future. So the irony is they want you to do something permanent that makes you not to have babies in the future, even though a lot of these women want babies in the future. And then two, it's like, it's the same thing with extra steps. It's like you play these mind games with yourself. I'm not dying for any ectopic, ectopic pregnancy. But see, the religious have this like martyrdom about them. Like white Christians are so concerned about suicide bombers. What do you think forcing women to die because they couldn't get an abortion is? In the name of what? Your God? They say it's for the baby. The baby's not going to live either, girlies. So I don't know why (laughs) what you're doing there. And then this fantasy they live by that people are getting nine-month abortions or people are aborting babies outside the womb. This is the problem with America. It is trying to reinvent the wheel all the time. The earth is flat. Vaccines are bad. We didn't go to the moon. Pasteurized milk is over. We're all into raw milk now. And they're aborting babies after they've left the womb. It's like, what? You know? Okay, this chatter is crazy. As a conservative man, first of all, disgusting. Thank you. I really want to understand your point of view. To me, abortion sounds like you want to be able to sleep around without consequences. Ban him. You're banned. Bye. Listen, I don't want these bubbles in my space because they're not going to listen. As a conservative man, I really want to understand your perspective. First of all, what does it matter that you're conservative? And what does it matter that you're a man? You should have just learned to listen. But you don't care because you've already decided that abortion is about being a slut. It's about medical care, okay? It's about medical care, regardless of how you got pregnant or why it happened. And I believe in preventative care. Abortion is a form of preventative care. It's the second step in preventative care, but it's still preventative care, okay? So as much as I would love to sit here and talk to conservatives, I have a pretty strong rule about not doing that because they are genuinely not interested in changing their mind. And if you were interested, you'd start reading books, you'd start getting to understand why people take, make this decision, and then you'd start to realize the world doesn't revolve around you and your bubble. And that's the dilemma. Late-term abortion makes up less than 1% of all abortions that are more often than not life-saving medical procedures. And this is the point that people are forgetting. You know, unless you are, in, you know, the irony of this is plenty of people will have their children and abuse them, but those people are considered better parents than the pe- people that had abortions. And that's the world we live in. I would rather you have an abortion than have a child you raise to abuse. Genuinely. Because you're preventing, like, it's about harm reduction. And that's the dilemma we're having. We also live in a world where, like, people all have different ideas of what kind of, like, what's worth it to them, what's not worth it to them. And I think what it gets down to is you should have the choice to do what's worth it to you. If it's worth having a baby... To you, at 15 years old, I support you and I want you to get the care you need to have that baby, right? Not because I want 15-year-olds to have babies, but because I don't think I have the right to tell you what to do with your body, okay? Especially if you're, you know, teen pregnancies happen, boyfriends and girlfriends date in high school, there's prom night, I get it. Of course, we want to protect people to the best of our ability, but ultimately, people also get to make decisions with their bodies. And so I want to give those people the care that they need, but I would recommend not having that baby at 15. But it's a choice I want to give you. And there's just one side of this equation that doesn't want to give you that choice. And that's the problem. I want government out of my business. And I want education to be amplified in this country so people can do preventative, preventative care. And are making the decisions and, about and our here's, bodies. And here's the other thing about this point, it, that it, it's about IVF treatments and access. It's about access to contraception, which is very much at risk with these folks. Um, it is about... Back to the point about reproductive health clinics. You know what those clinics also do? They do PAPs. They do breast cancer screenings. 
they do HIV testing. And they're mm -hmm. having to close in many places with these bans. Mm -hmm. So think about the fact that for anyone who has gone to one of these clinics, you understand that it is. My mom didn't believe me and a lot of pro-lifers won't where I was like, I've had to play in a parenthood for like lots of reasons. Like they are a medical care facility. They're not your primary doctor, but I've gone to them for STI testing, emergency contraceptives. I've gone to them to implant my IUD. Like I've gone to Planned Parenthood for many other reasons. Other, I've never had an abortion and I would never, um, I would never feel safe in a country that forced me to position to bring a baby to term or to with, to, have to be in a situation to endure a pregnancy that won't make it to term at the risk of my own health, right? It's not like we want to sit here and murder babies. We want to live good lives. And sometimes a baby isn't exactly a part of that equation, right? So Planned Parenthood exists. These clinics exist for so many reasons. Do you know one time I used to do, um, I used to do volunteer work for Planned Parenthood for just a couple of weekends, no big deal. And then I tried at one point in my life when I was a conservative coming out of the Republican party into the Democrats or independents, when I was doing my transition, I went to a Christian pro-life pregnancy crisis center. And I said, I want to help comfort women through this difficult time. And they said, okay, you have to pledge to Jesus Christ and you can never advocate for them to get an abortion. And I said, well, what's the point of being a birth crisis center if we're not going to give women the choice to get the care that they need for their medical like situation? And it was one of those things where I was like, I don't know, 19, 18, maybe I was really young. And so, you know, I sat there and I was like, well, why does, what does pledging to Jesus Christ have to do with women in, in need? And that's sort of the irony of these Christian organizations. You know, you ever hear a Trumper or a Republican say things like, the left is eating itself. Trumpers don't care who you vote for. We would never stop being friends with someone because of who they vote for. We would never make people like pledge to Jesus Christ like these people make you pledge to Muhammad. Um, are you sure about that? There are health care kind of socialized healthcare systems like solidarity that Christians use for healthcare. You have to basically say you're Christian to be a part of it. I think you should exist. And I think other things should exist as well. This idea that they're, they're not making clubs, this idea that they're not doing this thing where it's like, are you one of us? Um, not true, not true. And so this is the thing that for me worked to pop so many of my bubbles was I asked people, one, are you consistent with your values of no government in your business? Okay. And two, do you have a reasonable relationship with how you want the government to intervene in society? And then on top of that, are you really honest with your intentions and how you interact with people? And I saw from progressives and Republicans that some of them were not well-intentioned while others were deeply well-intentioned. I don't want to force religious people to do things that are uncomfortable for them, but they certainly feel comfortable forcing me to do stuff that I'm uncomfortable with. And that's the dilemma because they think they have God on their side. Man, I would feel confident too if I thought I had the almighty on my side. Too bad she's not real. Sometimes the most trusted place where people receive that kind of health care, because they walk into those places that are generally staffed by people who, ex who create a safe place for people to come in without judgment. So anyone seeking any kind of reproductive health care and, and wanting to go to a place where they feel safe and without judgment, these mm. clinics have often been the place that people can go. Mm -hmm. And many of them are having to close because of these laws. I was raised Catholic mm -hmm. and oh. abortion is a sin. Mm -hmm. And when I put out that episode, I had a lot of women reach out to me saying like, wow, I, I you know, live in the South and I never thought about it that way. Like maybe I am pro-choice because I won't get an abortion because of yeah, my religion, right. but why should we control what someone else wants and that's to do? Exa and you know, it's interesting, Alex, to your point, what I'm finding as I travel, people who before two years ago, before Roe v. Wade was, was overturned, people who felt very strong about that they are anti-abortion, anti-abortion, are now seeing what's happening and saying, hmm, I didn't intend for all this to happen. Hmm? And I think that's also why in state after state, so-called red states and so-called blue states, when this issue has been on the ballot, the American people are voting for freedom because ultimately it's about, look, this is not about imposing 
my thoughts on you in terms of what you do with your life or your body. It's, it's actually quite the opposite. It's saying the government shouldn't be telling people what to do. Period. Okay. Now this interview is longer. You can go check it out on uh, Call Her Daddy. This is just the clip that we had available to us today on YouTube. Great interview and great job for Alex being able to do this because I think it was uh, probably really tough and anxiety inducing to have to interview Kamala Harris, to have to have this conversation. But I think more than now, uh, the second largest podcast in the world, right? I think Call Her Daddy is the second largest female audience. It's going to motivate people to go out and vote, which I think you should do. I've already voted for Kamala Harris. I do recommend that you vote for her. If you would like to invest in sort of the future of America, you want to focus on global warming with these hurricanes happening. It's more than ever clear that we need to focus on climate change. We have things like LGBT rights, women's rights, medical rights, and care for families who are struggling financially. And we want to improve education in the States. And so I think like overall that Kamala is going to help us move in that direction. She's not perfect as a progressive but if you're playing the game where Trump loses, she is your choice. So, you know, may Trump lose, may Kamala win, and may we move into a more progressive, you know, version of America that is about all of us, not just some of us. Because right now the Republican ticket is about some of us. And I promise you, as afraid as religious people feel, they will not be left behind in a progressive world. They will have options to be religious. They won't have options to stop other people from living their life because they're not religious. And that's going to be the key difference. But ultimately, who knows? Maybe someone on the Republican ticket is going to give you something you need in another part of the world or here at home and you just got to vote that way. You do you. Right? But I'm not going to do it. Okay? Vote Kamala Harris. Okay. Now, with that said, I will say this. I don't really think... From a philosophical standpoint, it's not about who you vote for. It's about, do you know why you're voting for them? And are you ready to have that relationship and that conversation with yourself? Because it is interesting what we think we know about politics and the world and what game we're playing and why we're moving in a certain direction and why we think this is good for the world and why we think it's bad for the world. But really, for us? Is it good for you? Because so many of those women that voted for those pro-life policies ended up being the same women that almost died from ectopic pregnancies. And they were featured at the DNC and they were featured on Kamala Harris's tour and they were featured as stories of people that genuinely thought they were doing right for the world. And look, so many conservatives I know regret the Iraq war. They regret the death penalty. They regret three strikes. They regret so much of the policy that always sounds too good to be true. Anytime the government comes in and tells you that they're going to put bad guys away and keep good guys out, ask them who they think the bad guy is, because that's what's scary about living in a world where someone can decide, I'm going to put the bad guys away. Are these bad guys who have done something? Or are these bad guys that you think have done something? Is this what a bad guy is? And you know what else? You know, Project 2025 is coming up as like the biggest, like the, probably the scariest part of the Trump campaign. But I think what's interesting about it is that even... Hub has started to put ads in front of their videos. I think it's Hub to talk about 2025 because it threatens adult companies. You know, it threatens adult people from entertaining you. Protect your corn. Vote Kamala Harris, you know, because even Trump's side of the, it was just ironic since he's hired adult workers, since he's been involved in, you know, Epstein parties and Diddy parties and spoken very highly about these men. Like, it's kind of ironic, I think. This whole thing is just sort of ironic. Protect your choice. One side is trying to take away your choices. And just a reminder, Democrats aren't going to get rid of your guns. They're going to get rid of the ability for teenagers to get guns, which I think we should all agree is correct. It's going to take away the ability for people to buy in deadly guns easily, which I think is reasonable. And it's going to start preventing things that we're all afraid of, like school shootings. And honestly, just shootings in general. Too many shootings in America for us not to consider regulating guns. And I say this as like a person who's perfectly fine with guns. I've, I've grown up my whole life around guns. I have no problem with a gun. I have a problem with people who think they are smarter than the safety regulation of what a gun owner needs to, you know, the protocols we need to do as gun owners. And I think it's frustrating to watch people, parents, give children weapons that those children use to kill other people's children. He seems sad, so I wanted to make him happy. Keep guns away from your children or go to prison after they commit the crime, like a school shooting. Because as far as I'm concerned, you help that criminal kill other people and then get that person therapy.
because they shouldn't have been a teenager who wanted to shoot up a school in the first place. Teenagers don't want to just shoot up schools. All right, shout out to Kamala Harris. Vote coconuts. Thank you.